this was quite a tricky topic, and I think the title would have deserved a question mark as well. And I like to, um, when we talk about the evidence we have about side reductive nephrectomy and a survival impact, I like to compare this to this proverbial elephant in the room. And this seems to be, in this case, checkered by a pattern that disguises our view. There is an evidence, but it is not as clear, as visible as we would like it to be. And if we look at the um, data that are out there, and basically nothing much has changed since this publication of the RAND panel in 2006, then we can clearly say that we had a level one evidence in the area of immunotherapy with two randomized uh, uh, phase three trials, the SWOC and the URTC, that clearly showed that it would probably be a appropriate to do a nephrectomy in combination with interferon alpha, leading to a survival uh, benefit of about six months in the combined analysis. But in all other instances, it's probably uncertain. And this has been reintroduced by the fact that um, with targeted therapy, we saw for the first time responses in primary tumors. Now, what we do have in data, and that's what I would like to take you through in the next slides, is, is that obviously nobody would contest this. You have a large football in your abdomen and three or four small lung nodules. So if there is a disbalance between the, um, the, the volume in the primary tumor and the metastatic sites, then it is very clear, as Barbara Stefano has shown in a small retrospective series, albeit, but um, building on data that have been uh, produced in the immunotherapy area, that the more tumor volume you remove, the better is your progression-free survival and very likely your survival. And this is indirectly reflected in another publication. It wasn't the topic of this publication to, um, to give an indication on nephrectomy. That was a, a, a publication where these rare incidences of complete remissions were analyzed throughout France, where um, 64 patients were looked at and their um, status after they stopped with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But very interestingly, and that's what I saw in this publication, is that all of these patients had at some stage in their disease, admittedly, a lot of them, for curative intent before the onset of metastatic disease, removal of the bulk of the tumor. So in other words, without nephrectomy, you're unlikely to have a benef benefit of a complete remission. Now, what we will have to acknowledge is that most of our patients we see with uh, primary metastatic disease are not the candidates that are just portrayed. Most of these patients are the ones who will have 30 to 40 percent of the metastatic load left behind once a site reductive nephrectomy is performed. And the only thing we have here are retrospective series, and I don't want to go through all of them, but just mention the better ones. Uh, Tony Chiveri and his colleagues have analyzed about 314 patients, and they went through the effort to look at the influence of the performance by analyzing the Kanofsky score. And interestingly, here the survival is um, 23 or almost 24 months as opposed to 14 months in case of those who had uh, the kidney removed. But we should never forget that this is retrospective data. They are very likely biased. There's always a reason not to perform a nephrectomy. And maybe some of these patients had never been candidates surgically for performing a nephrectomy. Therefore, I tend to believe the data is more, not because I live in the Netherlands, but I know that in the Netherlands, very often, site reductive nephrectomy is simply not offered from point of views of opinions like we all have. But um, in this uh, population-based analysis, we could clearly show that the hazard of um, dying of this disease was reduced by 50% in those patients adjusted for all um, uh, factors we had, all prognostic factors um, for those where a nephrectomy was performed as opposed to there where it wasn't. But what, what makes us believe that we can change the outcome? I mean, I will never forget this sentence, uh, I think Vogelsang was it, who published it in his editorial to the um, uh, Flanagan trial, that what's the use of closing the barn door once the horse has bolted? So why should we remove a primary lesion? We would never do that in bladder cancer, for example. But we all know that the microenvironment is very important in renal cell carcinoma. There's abundant data out there, all in small series, and some of them based in uh, laboratory animals. But we know that there are pro-angiogenic factors, immunosuppressive components, and actually the, the, uh, the anaerobic glycolysis that sets in and leads to tumor cachexia, which I believe is very much the reason of the previous speaker uh, uh, has alluded to. 
But there's compelling evidence, and I think we've, uh, it has been talked about already uh, this morning, uh, by Marco Gerlinger's paper. And I think this is a very important paper, not so much from the point of view um, that with taking bi biopsies you may um, uh, find different tumor areas um, for, for um, translational research. But what it also means is that if you leave a primary tumor in situ, it could mean that through the vinyan speciation, you develop more aggressive subtypes that eventually kill the host. And is that of importance? Would that be of importance? If you look at the survival data we have nowadays with the targeted agents, if you would leave a primary mass in situ, and admittedly, most of the patients with primary metastatic disease are of intermediate risk score because they already have this, this uh, single factor of time from diagnosis to treatment less than a year and only few would have good risk, but you are talking about a survival time of maybe two to three years. And we do not know what that means if you leave the primary tumor in situ with regard to these translational aspects. But we can already guess what it means for um, the growth of the tumors. There are um, smaller series out there. There's one from the Cleveland Clinic where resist progression, so not just growth of the primary tumor, but really resist progression was noticed in 47% of these tumors. We saw that in uh, phase two trials, but I think the best data out there are actually from a retrospective analysis of 168 tumors from the MD Anderson, where the um, observation period wasn't as long as two or three years, but where it was clearly shown that um, though most of these tumors would respond, you could uh, see here that about um, in 5% of these patients, you will have to take for granted that tumors will grow, and some of them even excessively. So yes, you may argue it doesn't happen in a lot of cases. But what prevents us actually to acknowledge that there may be a survival benefit? And I think it is all about selection, and we've never been good at that. If you look at the data from the SWOC trial, for example, and um, though they had as a selection criteria good versus bad performance, but what we see clearly here is that after four months already 20% of those who underwent surgery or no surgery died. And this is quite dire. I mean, for, for performing major surgery in these patients, we should really try to exclude these patients before surgery. You may argue, well, this is of yesteryear and we are doing better nowadays, but if you look at this recently published series from Kutikov from community hospitals in the US, and it won't be much different in Europe, I'm sure, then they analyzed why, um, for example, the percentage of patients that would progress to um, undergo systemic therapy. In, a, in about one third of the patients, they wouldn't get the therapy they needed. Of course, there are different reasons for that, and if there's a decision for surveillance because the patient is faring well or the patient refuses, this is all acceptable. But if you collectively look at those who had rapid disease progression after surgery or even perioperative death, then we're talking about 15% of patients who have no benefit of this intervention. And we need better selection criteria. And the MSKCC criteria are actually based on oncological principles. And as uh, Chris Wood has already alluded to, we need better ones. And they've done a retrospective analysis and came up with surgical risk factors, which are published in Cancer by CULP. And I think the best way forward without a trial at the moment would be combining these MSKCC, uh, the uh, MD Anderson surgical risk factors together with preoperative therapy and only performing surgery on those who at least do not progress at metastatic sites. And uh, this is a retrospective analysis of two phase, uh, three uh, phase two trials of pre-surgical therapy which we published together with Tom Powell's in uh, European Urology. And you can clearly see here if patients with intermediate risk and no progressive, progressive of progression of diseases, metastatic sites would undergo nephrectomy, then their median survival at this observation period had not even been reached. And in all other cases, and admittedly we included poor risk as well, but also intermediate risk who would progress at metastatic sites, their survival would be less than a year. And th this doesn't mean that there would be a survival benefit, but it is very likely that only those patients who have a long-term survival would at least um, pluck the fruits of performing surgery. And without biomarkers, and we don't have them at the moment, I think the best way is if you do have access to these trials, the Camina trial that investigates the role of surgery, or the uh, EORTC Sertan trial that investigates the sequence of surgery, would be the best, because in both trials a translational program is attached to that is really necessary to come to more conclusions in the future and know who are the patients we will really have to perform surgery and, 
and who aren't. And with this, uh, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention.